Well, all right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the course today. I'm very excited to introduce Daryl Fannin, who is our guest lecturer for today. He will be talking about, or he'll be providing a slightly different angle on what we've been talking about so far, and we'll dive into the world of Hollywood film and movies to explain how blockchain and Web3 can be used in some really incredible ways within the film industry. So without further ado, I'll pass it off to Daryl. Well, Daryl, thanks so much for coming into our class. Thanks. I'm uh, very excited to be here and uh, to share what I know with you all and hopefully to learn a little bit myself. Hey, well, we can't wait. Well, so anyway, for context, so Daryl and I met, we met at ETH Denver a little while ago where Daryl talked about Kino and his project for how he is looking to revolutionize the whole film and Web3 industry and to provide more value to the filmmakers and to actors and everyone who's involved who typically may struggle with receiving all the royalties and profits and all the value that comes from their movies. And so, I mean, I'd love to hear a little bit from you. Like, what got you into film? Like, what is your film background and what, you know, what drew you in? Great, great question. So, um, I'm going to share my very personal story, uh, and we don't have to get into all of the details, but I think it kind of informs um, my story. I was born into a fundamentalist religious cult where I was not allowed to go to the movies or own a TV as a kid. So uh, I grew up in a very uh, odd environment where we were not allowed to wear shorts or play sports or listen to music or do other things that we called worldly entertainment. And so... Um, and I was a true believer at 17 years old. I was the youngest licensed minister in this group. So I was traveling around the US and Canada, converting people and, you know, being speaking in tongues and being called a prophet and all these things. And I realized um, that I believed a bunch of crazy shit. <laughs> um, and so as I began to kind of an, uh, analyze my own theology, I believe I realized we believed a bunch of crazy things. And to me, you know, when I looked at the Bible, it was full of stories of like, horrific violence and all kinds of stuff, but there was a greater moral arc. And I knew that that's what movies were. So I went to my friend um, and I was like, hey, look, I, I want to watch some movies. And so we snuck down to Blockbuster because that was still a thing. And we rented The Matrix. And I, my mind melted because I was watching the metaphor of my life play out on screen. I felt very much like Neo. I was living in a false reality. Um, I, I believed the world was one way. And in fact, it was very different. And my entire worldview had been framed for me. So I knew that I had to uh, escape that. And so to do that, I, I joined the military at 17 years old, having never been cursed at, which was its own crazy set of experiences. Um, but it, for me, it was kind of like that moment of unplugging, uh, where I was just completely uncomfortable outside of my comfort zone. Um, and the world did not look at all like I thought it did. And so I spent nine years in the U.S. military. I was a combat medic. Um, I was a soldier of the year in 2008 for the Southeast region of the United States, the Kanan Commission Officer of the Year for the state of Tennessee. And I found myself sitting across from the Sergeant Major of the Army, which is really boring to civilians, but in the military, it's a big deal. And uh, he was like, Fannin, you're really smart. Go to college and get a degree. You'll get promoted. And because movies had so changed my life, I decided to get a degree in screenwriting um, and, and actually writing and creating film. And I absolutely fell in love. Um, as you can imagine, writing movies is way better than being in the army. So in 2014, I got out and came to LA to get my master's degree in screenwriting. And then halfway through that program, I ended up selling a show to Netflix with Matt Damon and Peter Berg. And my Hollywood career kind of took off from there. So that's... That's my truncated life story. Wow, what, what an incredible background too. And I'm sure yeah. it's both very formative and creating, I mean, oh, your, I've never heard a story like that. They're just some very unique experiences. Yeah, I feel very fortunate because I, I grew up in an environment that was very much not like most Americans, I think. I, I hunted for food. Uh, we would um, grow our own food. I, I grew up in a very small world with a very different set of experiences. And as an artist, um, that is so helpful and informative to have lived some pretty extreme life uh, because my point of view is just kind of naturally different than most of the people around me. And I found it actually quite helpful as a founder as well, um, just to have a different perspective on, on things. Um, 
when you have to challenge your paradigm at a young age and kind of question everything that you've been taught, it um, it helps you, I think, kind of uh, punch holes in your own ideas, which is just invaluable in the world of creativity and in the world of creative problem solving, whether that's in business or in uh, art. So then looking back on and kind of comparing your, your childhood with your, your stage of life when you got worked in screenwriting and like you explored your master's, what were the biggest, I mean, were there any like big shocks or challenges to status quo that you experienced? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. I think I was very awkward <laughs> just because I didn't socialize like most people. You know, I didn't date. I didn't uh, go to high school. I was homeschooled. So my my exposure then came in the military, which has its own set of very specific um it's its own culture, you know, so I went straight from this kind of very odd culture into the military, which was amazing, and it taught me structure and rules, but when I got into the civilian world for the first time, um, I wasn't ready for the lack of accountability and just like the social nuance that exists and understand that like when I came to LA, I didn't even know who celebrities were. So I was literally buying people magazine and like cutting out photos of Jennifer Aniston and making flashcards because I knew that celebrities were currency in our industry. And in fact, um, if you're trying to make a movie or distribute a movie, especially when you co it comes to international sales, a lot of times those celebrities have extreme value and you have to know who is valuable in certain markets and all this crazy stuff. So I, and I didn't even know who these celebrities were. So I think the, um, when I started working in the industry, I, I will never forget, I was working out at this gym where, um, a couple of celebrities, uh, worked out. And so I, um, I would make flashcards just to try and like, remember, these are the people that I know and I'm talking to, and this is why they're, they're culturally significant. And then after I met them, I would go and I would watch as many of their movies as I could so that I could um, just have something to talk about with them and, and really understand the value that they created, which is so funny. I, I think the biggest thing for me was playing catch up in all of the cinema that I missed over the, uh, you know, the 17 years of my childhood. Oh, wow. And I'm sure seeing them face to face too at, I mean, at the gym was such an incredible experience as well. Oh, it's, it's amazing. Um, I will never forget um, the Milo Ventimiglia when we were, we worked out and he was telling us about this really cool pilot that he had auditioned for um, about these people who are triplets, but you don't find out until the very end. And uh, we were just having this long conversation about how he hoped he got the job or, um, you know, uh, John Krasinski, when he was getting ready for 13 hours, um, he was in the gym doing two a days and I would just see him kind of passing. And it was the craziest thing in the world because I was watching Jim from the office just turn into this like super badass special forces guy. And, um, you know, I, I doubt that those were significant moments to any person in that gym, but to me, it was life-changing because I was, I went from a world where I wasn't even allowed to watch movies to now where I was living among these stars. And it was just incredibly mind-melting. Um, it was, it was a very cool experience. And so then once you started working in Hollywood and you gained your bearings and became more familiar with the, with the Hollywood scene, so what was the initial problem that you identified or the challenges that led you to start pushing the limits of what the, I mean, what the world needs for movies and from, from Hollywood? Great, great question. Yeah. So um, I was very fortunate in, I sold, so when I was in my master's program, halfway through my master's program, I sold a show to Netflix and that does not usually happen. Um, in fact, all of my friends, except uh, one, um, when they graduated from college, the, the typical path was you got your MFA and then you would go work um, either on an agent's desk or as an assistant somewhere, hoping for the opportunity to get a staff writer gig and then work your way up in the writer's room. And this is a very brutal industry uh, in that, you know, <laughs> this is the only industry I know where it's almost expected that you work for free for your first two years as an intern or something, you know, like there's just a really brutal uh, space. So, when I, we were very fortunate, we had option to show. And I worked with uh, my best friend, Sean Vance. He was a Green Beret who had come to LA to kind of do UCB and Groundling. So he was an actor um, and he was absolutely hilarious. And we kind of had this deal where I would teach him how to write and he would teach me how to be normal and funny. 
and I'm a way better teacher. <laughs> so uh, I was still awkward and unusual. And um, we started creating all these things, but people really enjoyed our material. We were, we were funny and unique. And because we were both in the military, we had like a very unique perspective. And so we ended up optioning a couple of shows and Matt Damon found out and he was like, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> and um, I was like, no, obviously we didn't want to use the relationship. And so um, he was like, let me read some of your materials and which is like a dream in and of itself. Um, you don't ever get this kind of opportunity. So I, I was really kind of right place, right time, which um, you'll find for everyone who has broken into Hollywood. Everyone has their own story. A lot of times it's a 10 year overnight success where they've been working. You know, I had been writing for eight years at the point that Matt asked to read my scripts. So I was actually decent at it <laughs> um, uh, by that time. And so he read some of the stuff. One of the scripts we sent him was called Glutes. It was about a Hollywood gym known for turning asses into stuff. So, and it was a, it was a very funny script, um, but he sat us down and he's like, Daryl, Sean, you guys are hilarious, but um, if you if you take this show out, and I think it could have legs, um, if we sell this show, um, if we sell this show, they're going to give it to a showrunner because everybody in Hollywood has been in a Hollywood gym, so we all kind of know this environment. And and if you want to do something that is truly unique to you, you have to write something that only you can write because otherwise they're going to take this idea and they're going to give it to someone else. And so Sean and I took that to heart, and we went back home and for like probably three weeks we churned through about a thousand ideas that were mostly terrible, but we were just trying to come up with that thing that was what could we do that no one else could do. And then we finally came across this idea called the Green Berets Guide to Surviving the Apocalypse, half hour action comedy about the end of the world. It was an anthology series. So the world could end in a different way in every episode. So imagine like a super volcano, a nuclear attack, a pandemic. And what we would do is we would create this crazy end of the world scenario for this movie, and then the lead would break the fourth wall and tell you how to actually survive. So if a nuclear bomb went off a mile and a half away, I would teach you like how to close your eyes and open your mouth so that your lungs could compress under the pressure of the shock wave and you could survive that initial blast. And then I teach you how to go to your local CVS or pharmacy and use duct tape and trash bags and activated charcoal to make an actual hazmat suit so that you could survive the radiation. And so um, when we pitched this idea to Matt, he thought it was amazing. He was like, this is the... Uh, this is like the only genre of TV that I've ever seen like this. This is truly unique. Well done, you guys. And so with his confidence, he took us to WME, which is a giant um, uh, a giant agency. And we sat down with the heads and then they sent us out to Peter Berg's production company. And we knew that Matt and Pete hadn't worked together. And well, I knew that because I had done a bunch of research <laughs> uh, with my little flashcards. And so I knew that if those two uh, names were on something, it was much more likely that we could sell it. And so we we packaged it and took it out to Netflix. And um, it was an incredible, I, I mean, I can share the Netflix story if you're interested. I think that's like um, one of the more interesting, tangible um, film and TV stories. We were, we pitched to Netflix and, um, it was really amazing. Matt set, went into the room with us, which is a lot of currency in Hollywood. If, if you have a star that's willing to take their time to say like, hey, I want to go make this. And so we went into the room, we pitched, and I was driving Matt's Tesla back to his house because I had never driven a Tesla before. And Matt is very kind and he let me put it on insane mode. And so I was driving his Tesla back and Matt was giving us this big spiel about how we needed to manage our expectations. It takes, you know, there's uh, a thousand pitches roughly that they hear this year. Um, they may buy a handful. It'll be three weeks if we hear anything. And in the middle of this speech, we get a phone call from our agent because they had stopped him in the basement at Netflix. We had sold the show in the room. And so um, Matt was super excited. He was screaming. He slapped my buddy, Sean. Uh, I was trying not to cry as I drove because I was overwhelmed with emotion. Um, and we get back to his house and um, Matt's wife popped champagne for us. And then Matt FaceTimed my mom and dad to tell them that we sold the show, which was the most amazing thing in the world. And my mom, because of all the religious stuff, did not even know who he was. It was just Daryl's friend, Matt, which was hilarious. 
And uh, my dad had just watched the Bourne trilogy. And so literally the only thing out of his mouth was, oh my God, it's Jason Bourne. <laughs> and uh, it was just the most amazing human experience. But um, we sold that show to Netflix and it was an amazing experience. Uh, I got to write, act, and executive produce my own show. But then they fired the showrunner because we were way over budget and, you know, um, there were some issues with some of the scripts and stuff. And they ended up not replacing that showrunner. Um, and instead, they brought up another amazing writer named Scotty Landis. And it was kind of left on me to start running production meetings. So I was literally on my very first show looking at budgets and um, these very complex, uh, very complex budgets and, and day out of days and schedules. And I was way too involved. And what was driving me crazy is that I, I saw opportunity for technological solutions that were not being implemented. Um, so for instance, people were shoving cash into envelopes to make payments and distributions. They were handwriting ledgers and taping receipts onto pieces of paper to send faxes. And I was like, what is this, 1980s? Like, this is incredible to me. Um, and what I found out was that this is not uncommon practice. In fact, um, you know, there's a lot of issues within the industry and we can talk about plenty of them that we're trying to solve. But I think the biggest thing that I noticed is that um, we as human beings have a tendency to do something a single way. And we will do it that way until the day we die, unless there's a really good reason to change. And so um, just understanding kind of human behavior in film and television and across the, the, the board, I, I recognize that there was a massive opportunity for us to kind of like renovate the way that we do things. Um, and economically, film and television doesn't really make sense either. So the way that this system was set up, it was set up in the 30s, and it hasn't really been revolutionized since. Legendary Pictures brought in this new idea for film finance called slate financing. And I'm, I'm just talking now. So if you want to pump the brakes at any point and say, slow down. Okay. Um, but basically the way that film worked before then is we had a single movie. We put a whole bunch of money in that movie, and then we would take it out to the box office and hope that it made its money back. And as you can imagine, those are really high bets. Uh, and it's kind of like the roulette table, like you're, you're putting it all on black and then just crossing your fingers. And so, um, Legendary Pictures said, hey, that doesn't really make sense. Um, what if we created like a slate model or like VCs do with investing? So we're investing in a series of things. It's a fund. Um, and then we can we can disperse our risk. And that renovated the industry. They also brought in gaming and some other really cool stuff uh, and found some alternate ways of uh, bringing financial uh, value to the IP. And that turns legendary into like a seven billion dollar company within like a few, you know, a hand less than a decade. Um, and so, uh, but just conceptually to me, I still think that it, the way that we do it doesn't make sense because we spend, let's say, 18 months during a production window. So let's say it takes 18 months to make the movie and we will spend the budget of the film. So if it's an independent film, uh, like I'm going to use Get Out as a great example, that's about four and a half million dollars spent over a year's time to make the movie. And there's no product market fit. There's no marketing. There's nothing that happens. And then um, about six months uh, at the end of that production window, we then spend at least the amount of the movie, sometimes many multiples higher. In the case of Get Out, it was $30 million dollars advertising that film to try and make the entire world aware that this movie exists. And that is such a terribly inefficient model. If we took a fraction of those marketing dollars and spent them at the beginning, we could build an army of fans over the, that year or 18 months so that by the time we're ready to hit the box office, not only is the world aware of this film, uh, but they're also aware of why it's significant and why we should care. And if you, if you give fans the ability to invest in the film and actually own tangible pieces of the film, then we can actually become a part of a community around this film that also helps market the movie when it's time to hit the box office. And so to me, this has been just like a few of the basic uh, inefficiencies that I feel like we'll be able to eradicate with blockchain. And so, and you mentioned with marketing, you says you have many multiples that can go into that whole process. I mean, yeah. other than, I mean, what I would imagine being maybe advertisements, other ways of getting the name out, what are some other methods that like the traditional like marketing would look like for films like uh, blockchain. 
Yeah, great question. It's actually, it, film is really bad for the most part. Like there are stories of breakout movies that I absolutely love, especially in the low budget horror genre. Like when you think about the Blair Witch Project, right? Like they did some really interesting things around marketing there because they they made it this like found footage movie where you people thought it was real. And, um, or in the paranormal activity, uh, they showed videos of people passing out or like I remember in um, one of maybe it was Chucky or something like that. They had people that were literally in an installation where they would rip out of the poster and chase people. And then that became viral marketing, uh, really great Internet videos, uh, you know, that kind of thing. But for the most part, film advertising is extremely archaic. And we're talking about like billboard buys, you know, like so that when you're on uh, Hollywood Drive here or, you know, maybe on Rodeo or something, you'll you'll see billboard advertising. They do uh, sometimes radio spends and uh, TV spots, but these are millions and millions of dollars that are pumped into kind of an archaic marketing. Um, and, and by the way, there's nothing wrong with those things inherently. I just don't think it's the most efficient way to do this. And so, and now we're seeing, uh, especially, you know, in the realm of, of uh, obviously ad buys and that sort of thing on social media, so that there is some of those types of activations, but for the most part, we're dealing with an antiquated marketing system. Instead of bringing in fans and community and building like loyalty and, and giving, you know, kind of this exclusive fun access and community, we're seeing uh, an old model where it says, hey, you know, it is worth it to spend $30,000 to put a poster up on, uh, on Hollywood Avenue or whatever, Hollywood Boulevard. <laughs> Well, that's a great segue into the next part. I'd, I'd, I'm sure we'd all love to hear a little bit about how, I mean, you officially came up with the idea for Kino and then how, yeah, you know, how, you know what, all, all the input that went into to creating that. Yeah, so the impetus for Kino also kind of dovetails very nicely with my story around blockchain. So, uh, and if uh, my one of my co-founders, Austin, was here, uh, I would let him tell his story because it's absolutely fascinating as well, but I'm, I'm going to do a bad job for him. So um, as I was wrapping up um, the Green Berets Guide, and by the way, that show actually got canceled and never aired. So um, one of my biggest frustrations is that I've seen in the past, you know, in the almost decade that I've been in LA writing and creating movies with incredible individuals, um, there have been at least seven projects that I know of personally, where I know the creators that have had, you know, 10, $20 million put into the budget, and then it just gets rugged by these this system. And part of this is because of Hollywood accounting, um, which we don't necessarily have to get into here. But if you get the opportunity, I highly recommend that you Google Hollywood accounting, it will melt your mind. Uh, for a quick example, um, the concept is studios work very hard to make massive franchises lose money, um, which is great for them because it's a tax write-off. But for the creatives, it's absolutely terrible because we're promised all of these royalties and we never actually see them. So my favorite example, uh, and there are many movies that, that didn't make profit, like Star Wars, The Last Jedi, um, uh, Harry Potter, um, the Bohemian Rhapsody. Uh, these, despite bringing in billions of dollars collectively they have still lost money but my favorite example of this is lord of the rings the trilogy was made for around 281 million dollars it brought in six billion in global receipts yet somehow this trilogy is said to have never made any money and peter jackson was supposed to get about seven and a half percent on royalties uh for global receipts so we're talking about you know, billions of dollars in theory that he should have gotten seven and a half percent of. And in, in fact, he got nothing. So um, absolutely recommend that you Google Hollywood accounting. Um, but my story into this. So as I was wrapping up Green Beret's guide, my um, uh, editor, Bajan Shams, who's absolutely hilarious, he had done uh, he, he edited like the second uh, season of the Shelf Hell show by himself. So he's like an OG comedy guy. Um, and we we were talking about Bitcoin and he was just a Bitcoin maxi and just on and on about blockchain and decentralization and all this stuff. And I thought it was super interesting. And my brother, so I have a, a younger brother, he's younger by two years. 
and he's a badass. So when I joined the military and went into uh, serving the military, he went into engineering and he is a, a brilliant young man. He has worked for uh, FBI, Department of Homeland Security, three letter agencies you've never heard of. Um, and actually a TSA pre-check. So all the biofacial recognition software, biometric enrollment and data, um, that was all his technology. So if you've gone through TSA pre-check, you can thank David for that. But um, anyway, he had also gotten into crypto at the time. And we were, you know, this is the early days where we were just like figuring it out and trying to, you know, talk about altcoins and stuff. And one of the altcoins that we ended up um, purchasing was a, a a token called Elongate, and it was set up on the Binance Smart Chain. And I love this idea um, for the project because it was a meme token. Uh, uh, Elon had uh, Musk had tweeted, if there's ever a scandal about me, call it Elongate. And they thought that was hilarious that they would create a, a token, kind of focus it around charity, and we could automate giving to charity. And I thought that was a really cool premise. And so I threw some cash into it. And um, Anyway, that token ended up blowing up. It did like 500 million market cap at its peak. It was 500,000 people uh, had actually invested, uh, including my brother and I. And so uh, fast forward a few years, I'm writing a pilot with Jimmy Kimmel for ABC based on my best friend's real life, actually Sean. So the guy who I sold Green Beret's guide with, and he got to play himself in the show, which was super cool. Uh, Groovy Bruce Campbell was the dad. Uh, I don't know if you know who Bruce Campbell is, but Ash versus the Evil Dead, all that stuff. He's amazing. And Wendy Malick was playing mom. And uh, this was like a family comedy uh, based on a true story. So my, uh, Sean's parents were on the verge of retirement. Like they were in their like, like, 50s his the way he tells the story his dad was like circling his dream motor home in the rv in the retirement magazine and uh his mom really felt compelled to adopt a kid from the russian ukrainian border and so they did um and uh his name was david and uh anyway it was this beautiful story about a family uh, and adoption and the complexities around like um, growing up in a different culture and obviously as a person who grew up in an odd culture uh, and then was you know introduced to American culture I understood that slightly uh, and then the more time that I got to spend with this beautiful family I was just like this is an incredible story um, and so as I'm writing this pilot with Jimmy Kimmel, uh, he does a fundraiser for autism awareness with this guy named Mark Rober. And I had helped Mark uh, try and sell a show to Discovery a few years back. So this was like really cool that they were doing this together. And then Elongate ended up donating like $250,000 or something like that to their uh, fundraiser. And my mind melted because I was like, this is crazy. Like my worlds are colliding here. Crypto and, and uh, Jimmy, as I'm writing with Jimmy, this is all too amazing. So I reached out to the, the creator of this, uh, one of the founders of this token. And I said, hey, Austin, I'd love to pick your brain about blockchain in Hollywood and how this could change our industry. And so we sat down and for like, two and a half hours, we just started jamming. And I was telling him about all the things that I had thought of and, and the issues that I was facing and how I thought blockchain could fix it. And um, he kind of looked at me and uh, I thought, I think he thought I was lying about knowing Jimmy and all this stuff. He, he I don't think he believed me. Um, but after the coffee, I was like, hey man, if the thing in Elongate doesn't work out, like I'd love to work with you. And he rolled his eyes, but he was very kind. He was like, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, and then fast forward, like two months later, we sat down for coffee again, and I had found a Sequoia Scout that was ready to write a check. Um, and so it was kind of undeniable at that point. He was going to go off to big law. So he was at London School of Economics, USC Gould School of Law. He was on his way to um, kind of study at Fenwick and West, if you know the um, great legal uh, team that represents like Yuga and Coinbase and all the big blockchain groups. And so I talked him out of doing that and instead starting this company um, with the goal of kind of making film and television, not only more efficient, but sharing those, uh, those rewards with the people who are actually working. So um, I mentioned Hollywood accounting and how artists don't actually earn the value uh, a lot of times that they're creating. Um, and a great example of that is to me um, like Squid Game. That that 
uh, show brought in about uh, $900 million of value to Netflix. The creator only made a few hundred thousand dollars. Um, and that's like pretty inequitable uh, as far as like value creation to value return. And so, and I have several friends. I have a friend of mine who created a billion dollar franchise for Warner, only made a few hundred thousand dollars. Another friend who had one of the most wa watched shows on Netflix, 480 million views in just a few months. And now he's struggling to pay his rent. Um, and, and, not, and, and friends who have been on seasons and seasons of television for... Amazon, CBS, uh, Netflix, and they're they're struggling to get by and having to pick up jobs at a coffee shop, uh, making like minimum wage plus tips just to to get by. And I was like, this doesn't seem possible. It's not equitable. I think we can do things better. And so it was with that mission that we set out to create Kino um, and and not only eradicate those inefficiencies, but in doing so, we can actually save a bunch of money. And I think we can share that with the people who are making all of this wonderful entertainment that we all love. So that's also another great transition. So I guess we're getting into I mean, how this all works. I'd love to hear about how Kino can provide more value both to the actors and everyone who might be underrepresented in the rewards that come from I mean their their work but yeah. also how we can get I mean viewers and consumers involved as well yeah definitely great uh question so um big picture I think I like to think of of blockchain or this new um you know new layer of an internet I don't I don't really care what you call it um and I guess we should talk a little bit about the values. And I know this is probably preaching to the choir here, but I'm just going to tell you about the things that I found super interesting about this technology. Um, and that's that this is, you know, a, um, a distributed ledger technology that in theory, in the best version, it is decentralized, it is immutable, it is time stamped, um, it is anonymous, it is secure, um, it is pro it's programmable and that we can create these smart contracts that automate uh, and, and create a trustless system, which means that I don't have to know you or trust you, Nate. Um, I can just intrinsically go, hey, I'm wearing this, this Kino hat. You want to you want to buy this hat from me. You have uh, $25 in your wallet. I have the, the right to that and we can make an automatic transaction. That's really cool. Um, the problem with blockchain as it exists right now is a lot of this is in theory and not in actuality or it's um like uh immutable as a great example of this legally um this is not a significant technology meaning that um it doesn't matter really what the blockchain says uh what matters is like for instance terms of service and so when someone like open seas just changes their terms of service on their website now that immutable nft that you purchased uh is no longer immutable right and even the term non-fungible token I personally, um, I, I don't think that's a very useful term in NFTs um, because most of them are not actual, like many of them are fungible. If you think about like tickets to open air concerts that we're saying are, are NFTs, no, those are completely fungible. Um, you know, so like even the terminology around this doesn't quite make sense, but the value of this technology to me in the dream world, um, and it depends on the type of blockchain, right? If we're a public blockchain that's amazing because it's it's truly transparent and there is a lot of trust but then there's issues with like performance and scalability um and that sort of thing uh or, or if it's a private blockchain then well that's great because then there's access control and, and high performance but then the trust and audibility of that chain it can be called into question and then there are hybrid models obviously which are great for both performance and scalability but then you're struggling with knowing like uh is this truly transparent uh and um anyway the the point is that in a dream world though which is what i think we have to look toward if we're trying to be aspirational um we have to see that there's an opportunity here to create a more fair robust trustless system and so on that framework i am a firm believer in decentralized um you know, maybe not everything, but most things. I believe decentralization is the future, but also I believe in progressive decentralization because to get society from A to Z is a very, very, very long journey. 
Um, and in fact, you know, as a person who um, kind of helped talk their family <laughs> into getting out of a cult, I know personally how hard it is to take people and get them to change their mind. Uh, and it takes many, many years uh, even over simple things sometimes, and, and especially for behavior patterns that are engraved within us, not only as individuals, but within us as a society. And so um, when I looked at the immediate value that we could bring to the world, um, we, st we decided to start with the marketplace. Um, and I think that there's a protocol layer that is going to be extremely value. And I, we'll, we can talk about that, but Kino kind of exists in two phases. And phase one is the marketplace. And this is where um, filmmakers can bring their ideas to market and, uh, and have like, again, eradicating that inefficiency around bringing in fans. Um, and, and our offer to filmmakers is, hey, we're going to save a bunch of money. We're going to be more efficient and we're going to share that with you. And so, um, the basic premise is, let's say we have a $5 million movie and we take this $5 million budget and we go out to fans and we give you the ability to invest in the film so that you can literally own a share, uh, para pursu with the uh, original investors. So you're not like in some weird waterfall scheme where you're getting screwed over, but you actually see revenues when that film goes to the box office and makes money. Or you can buy uh, and, and that's obviously a, a smart contract, right, that you can have that will represent your share of the film. Or you can buy a collectible, like um, if this was Top Gun, you could imagine buying Miles Teller's flak jacket so that you could actually own this jacket uh, before the movie's made, uh, you get the right to that. And then after the movie's made, we ship you the jacket and you have the on-chain proof of authenticity um, or an NFT, or as we call them, we don't use the term NFT, we call them smart contracted assets, but you have a smart contract that represents your right to that prop. Or the other version of that is ticketing. And this can be as simple as like going to the red carpet and actually walking the red carpet behind the cast and crew, watching it in a theater. That's an NFT. That can be a PO app, you know, so a proof of, of attendance. Um, or it could be a visit to set or whatever. Like anyway, and the point is that you can build a, a series of ways to engage with a film that we haven't seen before. And the biggest thing to me is that I wanna create a community around the behind the scenes of a film so that you can actually see how the movie is made. And you can do Q and A's with your favorite like directors and filmmakers. You can find out why they're passionate about making this film. You can get updates from set and bloopers and like exclusive merch and sneak peeks. And you can you can actually get into a community around this film so that if you care about the movie, whether it's the filmmakers or the cause, you can you can build a community around this that actually has tangible vested interest in seeing this thing come to fruition. And, and that's kind of the big picture vision and goal. And what's really cool is that in film and television, um, the way that payments and royalties work, most people, and I didn't know this when I got into the industry, but most people don't receive royalties. So it most people that work on movies actually see no financial upside when that movie goes and makes billions and billions of dollars. In technology, that's the opposite. Everybody that works in my company gets uh, equity in the company. That's the point, right? So that we're financially incentivized to run in the same direction. So like, you know, it doesn't matter if you're an assistant or a secretary or an engineer, everybody gets a piece of the company because that's the value that you're helping create in the world. And so I want to do that with film and television. And the way that it works right now, we have what's called above the line, which are uh, executive producers and creators and writers and directors and, and really big name talent. And then below the line, which are the grips and the gaffers and the people that you've never heard of, but all of the people who actually make this movie come to life. And I'll never forget when I was shooting in Vancouver for Green Beret's Guide, um, they were shooting uh, the second Deadpool movie at the same time. And one of the stunt actors died on that film. Um, and it was absolutely horrific. Several of the, the stunt actors that were in our, uh, in our show uh, knew those people. They were good friends. And it, it really affected the community. And I remember sitting back and, and recognizing that all of these people who are literally risking their lives to make these movies aren't seeing any financial benefit. And that seemed very inequitable to me. So what we do is we create um, kind of like an employee stock, stock option pool, an ESOP, 
uh, for film and television where everyone who works on our movie, it doesn't matter if you're above the line or below the line, if you're a big name director or you're a PA, uh, a production assistant, it's your first day on set, everybody should get a piece of that movie when it does well. And so that's another thing that we're doing at Kino to kind of bring value to all of the people who are working on these movies, not just um, a handful. So it seems like a no brainer to adopt something like this, to get everyone involved and to have everyone receive these payoffs. But I mean, I'm curious, what do you see as the largest barrier to adoption? Like what is holding people back from adopting yeah. something like this? Great question. So I think uh, part of it is behavioral and reputational. So uh, blockchain has a terrible rap right now. And quite frankly, for good reason. <laughs> I think that most of what we have experienced in crypto has been open Ponzi schemes. We've seen it over and over, especially in the altcoin shitcoin world, where we're creating a smart contract that has no real value. We're pumping it because it's a picture of a doge. And uh, we're hoping that like, you know, hundreds of millions of people buy in and we're going to get it all the way to the top. And then we want to cash out up here. And, you know, there's no real value in the world. So what the world has associated with, especially NFTs, which people were creating smart contracts and, and they were creating like, oh, this is a cool, um, you know, it, it's a, a cool series of digitally generated cats, let's just say. Um, and that's awesome. But what, what does that do for the world at the end of the day? And even if you're into that, by the way, I think NFTs are freaking awesome, like no shade. But when you're creating this, a lot of times the smart contract didn't even give you the rights to the IP or the photo that was on top. So it was literally an empty smart contract that provided you as the buyer no value and people were promising us value that we would have the rights to these things um, and that this would be immutable and it would be ours forever. But again, it wasn't legally significant technology. So when you dig into the terms of service onto the website in which it was sold, you didn't actually have the rights. And so, so many people people um, were kind of rugged and scammed and built into a Ponzi that wasn't actually providing value. And so I think um, we have a reputational issue that we have to kind of address. But at the end of the day, I think we've done something really foolish in Web3. And I actually spoke at this on another panel at East Denver um, on the main stage. But um, we're trying to onboard a billion users. That's the big goal for uh, for for Ethereum and Near uh, specifically. And when we look at bringing on a billion people, we cannot do that by hyping the technology. Um, and I think that this technology is very cool. Uh, I am so excited, in fact, by the potential of this technology because it solves problems that I see in the world as far as like informational data that I have, especially when it comes to as a medic. It's so insane to me that we don't have a trustless system that communicates to every hospital everywhere, um, and you can just get your data from point A to point B. The number of times the army has lost my medical files, uh, and this is my information, you know, and they just lose it. And then I'm like, well, thank God I have a physical, tangible copy that I can bring in and we can rescan. Um, but that's that's silly to me. And we can solve a lot of these problems with this this uh, underlying technology. Um, I completely got off on a tangent and forgot where I was going. Can you, uh, re remind me of the question? Oh, you're talking about how, well, actually, actually it's kind of brings into the next question, which we can get into, which is kind of similar though, but you're talking about how excited you are about the technology and mm -hmm. how, and how you foresee this technology progressing. Mm -hmm. but I think something you brought up as well is, I mean, blockchain has received a lot of criticism and I feel like with anyone who works in Web3 or blockchain, they're bound to receive criticisms from blockchain skeptics. I mean, how have you gone about addressing concerns or people giving you a hard time for believing in what people, some people call it a scam technology? Yeah, uh, great question. And that does remind me the the um, we were talking about the barriers to people onboarding into blockchain. So um, just to go back really quickly, the barrier, the biggest barrier that I think that we have is that we're hyping this technology and not explaining the value to the end user. Um, do you, you know, right now we're using Zoom, very grateful for this technology. I have no idea what Zoom is coded at nor do I honestly give a shit. <laughs> and let, you know, like as a, as a user, uh, when I'm on Twitter, I want to be able to uh, spout my uh, unqualified opinion in 140 characters 
or less. And that's what I care about. I care that it functions and it works for me and that it's easy. And so to onboard individuals, I think what we have to truly do is create uh, something that is usable. When you're creating a product for anyone out here who, uh, if you are ever going to become a product manager, um, there's there's this idea of usable, feasible, viable, and valuable. So so we usable. This is the thing that Web three is really making difficult. You know how hard it is for my mom to just interact with regular technology, much less she's got to download a MetaMask and then like, or, or trying to get on my mom to get on Binance Smart Train and Rainbow Bridge. If I said that just those two concepts, I think she would think I was joking. Like there's, there's so much resistance when it comes to trying to get people on board. And in fact, in Kino, we, we have a web two plus web three approach. So we're, we're a hybrid model. I don't, I don't like to think the, of the world in like web three versus web to technologies. I think that's pretty silly. I still use paper when it's convenient. This is an ancient papyrus technology. Um, and I use the technology that is convenient for me in the moment. So uh, I love to write as a writer. I I like tangible notes sometimes. It helps me retain things. Sometimes I like notes on my computer. Um, at some point, I'm sure I'm going to want my notes to be on a uh, immutable ledger in the blockchain so that I can prove that it was my IP and that I had this idea time, you know, stamped uh, on March 15th at 7.48 a.m. in, you know, in California. Like, I imagine that that each of these have different values and uses to me. So we have to get to the point where we're making it easier and usable. The value is the other piece that I think we don't do a good job. We have to do a better job of explaining why this is important for you. But it doesn't matter how valuable it is. If it is extremely difficult, if it is not extremely usable, we're going to have an, a very difficult time onboarding individuals. So what I love about everybody in this room is that we're early adopters. We are looking to the future and we're excited by this technology technology and the potential, but we have to realize that we are a very small percentage of the 7 billion populace that currently exists. Um, and then as far as the, the reputational issues, that is a real thing. Um, I have had multiple film financiers who refuse to be involved with blockchain in any given way. Um, in fact, I was on a phone call with um, I don't think I can say who it is, but it's a very large agency entity uh, that has a financing arm. And uh, it's not CAA, obviously, because they're very supportive of blockchain. But uh, this person, basically, I was two sentences into my first uh, uh, introduction, and he's like, blockchain and crypto is a scam. And then he went on for 20 minutes, just talking about how this was such a scam. And this is someone who saw the Web 2 revolution and how it changed the world. And I just simply reminded him of the Web 2 scams uh, and, and how we have technology is not the scam. The scam are the individuals. There are, there are irresponsible individuals like SBF uh, and others who, who I think need to be held accountable um, but they're, you know, like anytime you're giving yourself a billion dollar loan, like that's re reputational damage to the general populace. We hear these things and we think, oh, that's absolutely terrible. But the reality is that the technology will stand on its own and it will stand the test of time. Um, but we have to, as builders, stop building fluff projects. And we, the world does not need another shit coin. The world does not need another empty uh, layer one protocol that doesn't provide any additional value other than it's just a new currency. What we need are smart contracted assets that have legally significant tech, like legally significant technology where we're, we're innovating and we're not ignoring the, the securities regulations that exist in the world or trying to put our head in the sand and pretend that this isn't going to be an issue. We need to be forward thinking about how to bring society on board. And a lot of that is taking taking into account the legal, um, the legal aspects as well. So then going off of that, I mean, I was fortunate to meet a lot of members of your team. I mean, I think I met Austin and Britt in Denver, mm -hmm. but when you're, when it comes time to form a team, well, I guess for some context, our course revolves around the potential goal of teaching everyone who's taken the course, how to build out a web three project, how to pitch to VCs and essentially be able to back their project on all aspects. 
And so wow. when it comes time to building your team, and, and so I guess our final project, which will be on Friday, will be elevator pitches as well as written proposals for their projects, including technical components, overviews, use case, adoption, all these things. And so when it comes time to building out a team, how did you build your team and what might what advice might you have for doing so? That is a great question. And I think probably one of the most important things when you are building your early team, you need individuals who understand the vision. Uh, you need people who are capable of executing that vision at a high, high, high level. Because, um, and this is something that was all relatively new to me. Uh, the, the VC space, um, I, I had not entered it uh, a year and a half ago. I didn't know anything about venture capital. I didn't know shit about pitching. I knew film and television, and I had sold multiple shows in a room. And the good news is that pitching, which is different than building the team, pitching is all about storytelling. And um, you want to take people on a journey. And, um, and I'll get into that. Uh, but when it comes to building the team, you have to look ahead. And this is very difficult because as a, a, a founder, you're balancing the tangible needs of now with the build and needs of tomorrow as well in mind. So um, the way that I like to use this is my military example, which is um, we, we would have a series of, of targets uh, if, if I'm a shooter, uh, and the 25 meter target is the closest, that's the biggest threat, that's the thing that I need to focus on, and that I have to have in crystal clear focus. Um, I need, like, if I'm looking down my sights, that's the thing that I'm focused on, and then that 50 meter target, I know where that's at. Um, it's a little bit blurrier because it's not quite as in focus, but when you get all the way out to 300 meters, like, I don't know. <laughs> so, so what you have to do is you have to build a team that's capable of, especially in the early stages, your generalists. Um, you need people who can pivot on a dime, people who are willing to uh, creatively problem solve with you, and you need experts in their own vertical. So for instance, we started off with myself, uh, who is an expert in film and television. I knew we needed a um, an expert in securities regulation because I wanted to do things the right way. Um, and so Austin studying at the London School of Economics and the USC Gould School of Law, specializing in securities, I knew that he was my guy um, because he understood you know, Reg A and Reg CF, which are the crowdfunding uh, and Reg D and how to um, build legally significant technology. So the legal side was very important to me. Um, it is very rare that you find a lawyer or someone who has any legal training on a founding team. And if you are going to be dealing in the world of securities at all in a Web3 space, 10 out of 10, you've got to find good uh, legal counsel because uh, we have Fenwick and Wes on our, we have, we have like four outside counsels on our team. Really incredible. Greenberg, Glusker, and film and television. Absolutely amazing. But these people charge like you know, a thousand to fifteen hundred bucks an hour, and as a as a small company, you will go bankrupt <laughs> just trying to make sure that you're uh, fulfilling the right legal requirements. So, if you're going to be dealing with um, securities, highly recommend finding a lawyer. But we also knew we needed uh, someone who understood blockchain intrinsically. So, our first, um, and of course, my brother was on board as an advisor from the very beginning. Uh, just you know, and he had built, I think I told it, multi million dollar. Uh, technologies for like three letter agencies for the government is very, very secure. Um, and he also understands how to build scalable teams, um, which is extremely important. A lot of, a lot of times when you're looking for that CTO uh, or that technical co-founder, um, you need someone who has had time ideally as a product manager uh, in design, like you need someone who truly understands the, the entire process of building and scaling a team. And then, um, so that's the technical side. We actually found an incredible uh, blockchain engineer. His name's Milan Saxena, uh, but he went to uh, Berkeley uh, and studied blockchain. He was on early team at Anchor. Um, and then he came to LA to get his MFA in screenwriting uh, from USC. So this is like the perfect blend of blockchain and film. Like this guy got it. Um, and then Britt was a CMO for Casting Central out of Canada for a decade. She's a total badass, worked on some of the biggest shows that had gone through there, like The Boys, uh, Handmaid's Tale, uh, those kinds of things. So she understood marketing and 
very, very, very well. And she was also very well connected to the industry. Um, and as a core team, uh, that's the, so my brother, myself, uh, Austin and Britt as our, our core team, we have our own verticals that we're experts in, um, that we are truly like highly aligned experts. And, and that was enough for us to kind of know that we had the team that we needed to scale. Because when it comes to venture capital and when you're pitching VCs, what they really like, they want to know how are you going to become a billion dollar business? And in fact, one of the VCs that we have pitched and we're going through due diligence with right now says, and I quote, I don't invest in billion dollar companies. I invest in trillion dollar companies. And so, and like part of that, I think might be egoic. Um, this is being recorded, Daryl. <laughs> but the point is that they want to know that you can scale with your team. So if you are if you are building a team, I think the biggest thing is measuring your needs for now, making sure that you can hit that 25 meter target, because that's what un unlocks your funding. This is another thing that nobody told me, um, but you need to build a success metrics and say, at this point, my company's worth this much. I'm going to raise money in. And there are a lot of incredible programs uh, to help people get started. Some of them are quite predatory. So they're like, hey, we're going to give you $100,000 for 6% of your company, 7% of your company. Now, listen, if it's just you and an idea, maybe that's worth it because that gives you the capital that you need to get going. But um, if you think about what it takes from being a company uh, that's worth $600,000 and scaling that to a billion dollars, that's a long journey. And so to me, it was about creating enough value and casting a big enough vision that people could see the billion dollar idea, but they knew that we had the tangible resources in front of us to get to that first 25 meter target. That was a lot, but <laughs> I hope that encapsulated the question. Yeah, that was excellent. Hearing about how you form your team, what you look for, as well as balancing not only people who are relevant to industry, but also all the other components that that are important for any for any team. Thank you for that. Yeah, of course. I think if you haven't read Fundraising by, uh, uh, what's his name? Hold on. Fundraising by Brian. Hold on. Ryan Breslow. Uh, I was going to drop the link in the chat, but I, I, we can do that later. But the point is, if you haven't read Fundraising by Ryan Breslow and you're interested in venture capital and, and trying to raise a team, I found this book extremely helpful. It's extremely digestible. Um, uh, and it was just like a great introduction to me because I had I had never um, I never tried to raise millions of dollars before. And it's quite difficult, especially in this environment. Um, <laughs> we launched this company uh, literally um, just over a year ago. So in March of last year, um, I launched this company. We raised over a million dollars in our first tranche of our pre-seed round. Um, and it is a very difficult journey uh, in what we call the bloodbath of the Web3. Uh, you know, things started to implode about the time we decided we were going to go raise money in Web3. So um, it is a uh, difficult journey in this environment. But what's amazing about that is that um, if you can withstand this pressure in, in the bear, you're going to absolutely destroy in the bull. Because um, it's difficult now because you have to actually show traction and value and 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 all of the things that in theory you're supposed to have during the bull market, but because people kind of became blinded by um, the ability to just flip a coin. Um, and in fact, entire VC groups in Web3 have only made their money by just flipping coins or being early in on a coin and then letting it, you know, uh, blow up. And so they, there's not the fundamentals there. Um, but if you can build a business with solid fundamentals, you will last through the, the bear market. And that's how you are truly the diamond in the rough. That's great advice. I can completely agree with that. So thank you for bringing that up. Well, I've, I've two more questions for you and then we can maybe open up to questions from the class. The awesome. first is that, I mean, also relating to what you just talked about, love to hear if you have any advice for selling your project as well as yourself, especially during a difficult time in Web3. I mean, like, I mean, in the bear market that we're in right now, it can be very yeah. difficult. Yes. Um, I think 
they're selling yourself in, in the first meeting that I take with VCs. Um, a lot of times it's more selling myself in the vision than anything else. Um, and I believe that, um, all of life is pretty much storytelling. When I am talking to venture capitalists and I'm trying to get money, I'm telling them a story about how we're going to be a billion dollar company, but more importantly, their capital is going to enable us to go on this grand mission. Um, so it's always focusing it on the, the end user or the person that I'm talking to and making them kind of the hero of the story. So when you're telling your story, um, if you notice when I talk about my journey into crypto, I start by talking about how I grew up in a fundamentalist religious cult where I wasn't allowed to go to the movies because one, it's, it's a hook. It's interesting. At least, you know, like I know that they're going to remember the conversation when we're done. Uh, but also it sets up my premise of my journey into film and TV. And so when I, I tell everything, I tell it as a story and you're trying to get, um, you're trying to get people from point A to point B, and that is often just by telling them a story. There's a, a couple of great business books. Uh, Tell the Win, I think, is one of them. Uh, Pitch Anything. These are these are stories that um, are books that kind of focus around how storytelling drives um, the lives that we live. So if you have a story um, that you want to share, and let's just say you're an engineer. You've got to find the passion and why you're passionate about that. Because if you can explain your passion, if you can start with the why you care and why they should care, and you can bring them on a very short but entertaining journey, um, they're infinitely more likely to listen to the facts and the figures and the materials that often people will just glaze over. Um, and in fact, again, at Web3 in Denver, the number of pitches where entrepreneurs will start by just throwing up a very boring chart and say, hey, like, look at all these facts and figures and statistics. Um, that's great. Technology stacks are important, but the narrative is why we care as human beings, because we're emotionally driven creatures. So um, 10 out of 10, uh, craft a narrative around your own personal journey, even if it's smart and short and not as exciting. Um, you know, you can talk about if you're a kid from Ohio, um, you can talk about how you grew up in Ohio and that world was so different from the world of technology. Or if you're a kid from, you know, it doesn't really matter where, wherever your origin is, and it doesn't have to start as a beginning as a kid, but definitely like why you're passionate and, and tell them a story, take them on a journey and make them emotionally care about your product. Um, even if it's a SaaS product, you've got to find a way to make people emotionally care. That's such incredible advice. And, and thank you, David. David went ahead and shared some of the links to the books that you mentioned as well. Oh, thank you. Awesome. Those, so we have, have all those set, but yeah. And yeah, it's the last question I had right now. Well, before that, well, actually, yeah, the last question I had was about the future that you'd hope to see enabled by blockchain. Where do you foresee the space going or where would you like to see the space in five to 10 years? In five to 10 years, what I would love to see is mass adoption. Um, I would love to see uh, I would love to see sensible regulation. Uh, I would love to see an embracing uh, culturally uh, across, you know, multiple countries, the, the opportunity for a single source of truth. Uh, for lack of a better term, like with medical, um, for information so that when a company wants to use my data, instead of just taking my data and exploiting it without providing any value, maybe that there can be value exchange. I think that we're seeing already with, you know, um, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, that there's going to be a massive disruption across all industries. And, and initially, you know, I, I remember five years ago thinking that in five to 10 years, um, automated shipping was going to be a thing and truck drivers were going to be out of jobs. And, um, and now it's super fascinating because I, I hear the same kind of thing in film and television where uh, artists who do storyboards are like, oh, you know what, I'm about to be completely replaced by chat GPT. Um, and maybe that doesn't happen in the next five years, but I do think that in the next decade, we're going to see massive disruption of technologies and we're going to need um, a we're going to need a stopgap for individuals. And I'm hope and I am hopeful 
that blockchain can provide a, a source of kind of passive income for us as a society because we're exchanging value constantly, uh, whether that's in putting our eyes and attention into something uh, or our energies or, you know, uh, people are using our data. So I foresee the potential for a utopian existence um, in which we are just operating more efficiently and we're making sure that the basic needs of humanity is being met. And we can do that across many societies, um, not just the United States, but that is, um, you know, or, or even first world countries. Um, but that is a very long, difficult journey ahead. Uh, and I think it takes very passionate uh, builders with an eye to the future. And um, I'm excited to see, I, I'm excited to see what happens because what I know more than anything is that um, potential in and of itself is not enough. It takes someone who understands potential and who's willing to build toward that. And um, I hope that what I am doing in my small part of the world, film and television, I'm very fortunate uh, that's where I landed and, and blockchain is going to have a direct impact in my community. And I want to be one of the leaders because I think if I'm leading that revolution, then I can kind of help dictate how those funds are being <laughs> reallocated. And so it doesn't matter if you're whatever your part of the world is like, look at blockchain, how it's going to change that part of the world. And then you can be influential in that, whether it's in an in automotive industry or real estate or Again, you know, some SaaS product uh, that I have no clue even exists. Uh, whatever your part of the world is, I think um, innovate and build and do it intentionally with the goal of making the world a little better. If we can all leave the world a little better than we found it, which is that terrible Boy Scout thing. But it's like, that's where my heart is, that it's like we have the potential here to affect change. And I think what is really sad is that most of us just don't do the things that we know need to be done. Yeah, I don't know if that answered your question, actually. Where do I see it going? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the honest answer. I am hopeful that we will build towards something great. Yeah, and especially, just, I mean, I loved what you said about a hybrid between Web 2 and Web 3 because, I mean, I personally see the, the most effective integrations are for people who don't have to connect a MetaMask wallet or you can mm -hmm. use the underlying infrastructure that exists in web two and feel like they're working and interacting the same way, but also doing so in web three. Yeah, actually. So when we use, I, and we never really got into the, uh, the, the protocol, we have a protocol that we're building out that will hopefully enshrine IP rights for creatives from the very beginning, um, all the way through from the creation, uh, financing, production and distribution cycle. And that actually, that, that cycle happens in all forms of creative content. So that's, that's a super exciting um, value proposition. But um, if we're in the very beginning, like if you're on our website, um, you, you have a choice to export to blockchain. So instead, and which is very unique, and I don't know any other group that's doing it this way, your checkout process feels very web too. You're using fiat or credit card. It just feels natural. And then I can educate you on why it's valuable to use blockchain. And I can incentivize you to do that by giving you, like entering you into a giveaway where you could potentially win a red carpet ticket or something like that. I can incentivize people to use this new technology so that and it's worth it to them. I can create value for them and I made it usable and easy to use near. Um, we, we are chain agnostic. I truly believe um, in, in the fact that we don't know what chain is going to exist at the end of the day. So like, why would we limit ourselves to just one? Um, and so, uh, but to me, what I, I think is super interesting about near is that they're focused very much on creating an easy wallet uh, and, and, and making that entire process frictionless. Um, and they have some things that they're going to be rolling out that I don't think I'm allowed to speak of yet, but it's it's going to be a game changer when it comes to the usable uh, portion. And I'm very excited about that. That's great. Well, then also, are there any other... I had a question I was going to ask. Uh, well, it'll come back to me. But I guess in the meantime, one question I've been dying to ask is, I mean, I, I noticed the Green Braids Guide poster behind you. Yes. You, uh, one, that looks phenomenal. But two, is there any, I mean, it, it's a it's a massive understatement to say that it's a bummer that 
it, nothing was ever produced out to the public. I'm sure I know. For, you, for you, orders of magnitude greater than for, for all of us, but yeah. is there any content that's available online or clips that we could watch that are available? Um, I don't know if there are any, uh, this is recorded. I don't know if there are any legal clips, but I have heard that uh, one of the individuals may have leaked some of that content. So if you were to Google it, you might be able to find uh, some very old cuts. Um, but I also like, let's see, um, I did a, a more serious film recently that Sylvester Stallone executive produced um, uh, that I actually acted in as well. It was based on uh, some veterans. It's a, it's a much more serious um, story. It's called MVP, Merging Vets and Players. It's based on a, a true story. So you could probably see that. I think it's on Showtime now, maybe. Um, and then the pilot that I did with Jimmy Kimmel is not out. Uh, but there is some content around. If you uh, if you decide to to dig into the ether, you might be able to find something. So it's um, one of those you cannot confirm nor deny. That's exactly right. That's exactly yeah. right. Uh, I one of my favorite. Uh, I'm gonna here. I'm just gonna do this really quickly because the um, on Green Beret's guide, everybody signed, and they were just like, uh, you know, you guys rock. This was amazing. You made my job so easy, all these wonderful things. But there was one person who had an absolutely terrible time. And so he just wrote, it was interesting. I don't know if you can see that right here. Uh, boom. Yeah. He just, it was interesting. And I thought that was the funniest, <laughs> the funniest, uh, the funniest piece of uh, all of my memories. I think that's the best because he had an absolutely terrible time on set. He was going through a lot of personal stuff. And um <laughs> and there's, there's a graphic too like a skull with a knife yeah exactly he was exactly. not not having it <laughs> he was not having it he was in the art department he was he was great um anyway yeah well hope he's doing better now yeah me too yeah well then i guess that's most of the questions i had um i guess now we'll open it up to any questions from the group if that still works yeah, Dave, exactly. anything? Is there anything yeah I've, I've been gathering the questions as they come in so i have the first four. Um, they're all very brief, but the answers may be longer. Okay. Um, let's have a look. I just want to put these in a logical order. Um, one of the more general questions is, uh, does Daryl have any ideas about how to change the distribution itself using Web3? What can be improved? Yes. Oh, that is a wonderful question. I think the distribution uh, in film and television is actually one of the bigger problems to solve. Um, right now, we still operate in what is uh, a very web to um, centralized manner. A lot of times the, uh, the, the distribution, um, because it is controlled by centralized entities, uh, is also where a lot of the Hollywood accounting takes place. So for instance, um, if I were to take my film out to a, uh, a regular theatrical release right now, um, a lot of times the marketing department, they charge like a 30% uh, of whatever our marketing budget for that is. And that comes baked into distribution. So um, I'm very excited. There are a handful of individuals that are creating some pretty interesting products. Uh, I was looking at Live Peer very recently. Um, there, there are several interesting products there. Um, but I think that we have to get to the adoption piece and the usability piece, because um, even if you put your film out on a Web3 platform, let's just say a Web3 distribution platform, and there's all kinds of really cool ideas about token gated access and how that can work, the underlying infrastructure to make that easily available on my Apple TV does not yet exist. So I think that there is all kinds of um, exciting developments that are taking place and people are building some really cool technology. Um, but we're probably uh, we're probably five years out from any type of uh, significant enough of an adoption where that becomes a viable means for um, for films. Now, that's not to say that some indie films or, or very specialized platforms won't have that. Um, in fact, I know plenty of people who are already exploring token gated access to their film. So you can own the NFT um, a smart contracted asset, and that will give you access to the movie um, to watch. And I, I think that's interesting. I just don't think we're at a place yet where that's going to be a, a truly viable option. 
That's a great question, though. Next question. Let's assume that many films make um, a large part of their money from the sale of screening rights. If we create a fan base that invests in the film on Web3, uh, we also offer the share of the profits. Yes. Um, so the idea is, that is exactly the idea behind what we're doing. Uh, if you go to democratizefilm.com, you can probably see some of our uh, small speeches and stuff on this, but my goal is for you to be able to invest in a film and make returns uh, and profits when it goes to distribution. And what I actually want to do is make these movies profitable before we go to distribution. Um, I cannot mention the, the film itself or the individuals involved, but our first film is a very low budget, $2 million feature with names that you will recognize um, they're fantastic and we are working, everybody is working for, uh, what I would consider less than their rate. But the idea is that we will be able to bring in fans and revenues, and hopefully we can actually be profitable before we get into distribution. Uh, and then the people who have invested in this film will be able to see returns before we even have locked in. Um, the way that film distribution works, we have two kind of options. Option one, Daryl goes to Netflix or Disney or whoever and kind of sells it up front. That's uh, usually at what's called a cost plus model. So this is Netflix's uh, I, Netflix gets the biggest credit, but really this is an advent of streaming where they pay us like, let's say 120% of the value of the total uh, piece of property. So let's say it's a $10 million movie. They go here, Daryl, here's $12 million, go make the movie. And then the $2 million profit, that's what's shared between you and everybody who works on the film. Um, now that's kind of nice because you know how much money you're going to make. Uh, but on the downside of that, you don't see any of the upside participation. So if that film then turns around and does, uh, uh, you know, 800 million views in two months, um, doesn't matter. You're not, not going to see any more money. Uh, and then the other version of that is the theatrical release or windows. Um, and that is usually, let's call it a three to six month theatrical release. And then you have... Um, AVOD or advertising video on demand that can be like um, uh, oversimplified, but let's call it like a Tubi uh, or like when you see in theaters now when you're in a hotel and you have the, the entertainment that's provided to you, that's uh, advertising video on demand. And then there's SVOD, which is streaming video on demand. And that could be more like uh, Hulu or Netflix or one of those longer term ones. And so there are different windows that you get paid out. Um, and so, uh, in theory, um, it doesn't matter which one of those we choose you as the person who have invested would be able to make your money back when we go make those deals. Uh, but the upside obviously is much higher if we do the theatrical release. Um, but we have to make sure that we have the international support because with that usually comes, uh, you know, selling, uh, different markets like Germany and Russia and South America and, you know, Asia, they, they all have different markets and different value propositions and people in different uh, regions care about different actors and about different genres, which is very interesting. Um, and in fact, you know, the, I think the global uh, nature of this industry is going to become much more interesting with the advent of web3 because we're going to be able to invest in all kinds of stories and personally i love western stories i think they're cool but the kind of mythological structures and storytelling that comes from uh, areas that are not predominantly the united states are infinitely more interesting to me and i'm excited to champion those kind of underrepresented stories around the world that was a long-winded answer to that question. <laughs> um, you're here with us today to talk primarily about movies, but at least structurally speaking, we could introduce related themes like music videos or perhaps even visual art in general. So if we just let's stick to video art and music videos, do you find that they are being 
promoted or published or discussed on the same platforms or are there particular places that we should look at that are separate from the cinema um, uh, ecosystems? Very good question. I think that uh, there is undeniably a massive value in all forms of visual art. Um, and again, the creation process and the underlying IP uh, layer, that protocol, I think is going to be valuable to all different forms. But the distribution mediums are very, very different. Um, and in fact, uh, I mean, you know, I think the easiest example is that you can't go on to any in the HBO streaming service and watch music videos uh, on HBO Max or on Hulu or Netflix. And so those are very fundamentally different, um, different business models. Um, and so I love visual mediums of all forms, um, but it is very difficult to uh, do to make money in um in music videos because it, it is literally about views and a, a lot of times monetize a lot of times monetizing uh that viewership and i have a lot of friends who have done both um and it's you know it's a different game in fact uh the director of our first film um who i can't say uh just did a music video uh two weeks ago um and he sent me a bunch of amazing footage from the set it was absolutely insane but the reality is that they're going to have to monetize that on youtube and will likely not make their financial investment back um because even though you can get millions and millions of views um it isn't directly tied into the streaming royalties of the song itself um and this is where i think Again, not to keep talking about Kino as the, the blockchain in general, but I'm super excited about our underlying IP protocol, because when you think about the creation of a music video, um, it's the exact same as the, um, the creation of a film in the process, but the payout is so different and the way that we monetize is so different. And so if we can um, create an IP protocol that protects that IP in the very beginning, then any way that this piece of IP is monetized, the people who invest in this idea from the very beginning should be able to reap those rewards. And that's what we're talking about is getting away from this such individually siloed piece where the music is seen completely completely different from and separate from the uh, music video itself. And so I think that we're going to enter into a world um, where, you know, there are going to be um, STEM creators who will have stems on chain uh, and, and producers will sample that stem and then it will be plugged into the music video that the director is working on and blockchain enables every single one of those people to be able to be paid efficiently and effectively. Um, we're just not quite there yet. If by using NFT, well, in fact, your project, uh, I, um a second name or second title of your project is democratize cinema, right? Mm -hmm. So you obviously have an idea, a very, um, you know, admirably a romantic notion of who cinema belongs to, who can invest in it, who can benefit from it. But if you use the technology of NFT, and this is an audience question, yeah. what, what stops one of the major players coming in from just buying up all the NFTs before the general public has a chance to participate? That is a great question. Um, so the reality is that um, there are going to be groups that will try to do these mass buys. And internally, we've had a lot of conversations about how to make it available to the general public. So we have uh, a core group of individuals that will get uh, early access, um, but we are not going to give them early access to all of them or to buy them all out. And then when it goes into the public, we have some technological uh, pieces in place that keep people from just mass buying. Um, but the reality is that these are problems we have to work on. Uh, and I will not, unfortunately, be able to, it, it, in the world of truly uh, free and open, this is one of the problems, is that uh, that is that is what we're signing up for, is the ability for people to come in and buy and, and automate systems and, and smarter people. Um, you know, I, I'm sure people will be trying to create bots in the future that as soon as there's a drop, and we actually have already seen this. Um, what is interesting is that even currently, a lot of these NFT drops where they sell, you know, $50 million and 
just two hours, you know. Uh, these are a lot of these are actually pre-sold. Um, and so there, there's a lot of things that happen behind closed doors that we don't see. And then it just gets all minted on chain at the same time and then distributed. So I think that we're going to have to solve for some of these problems, but we already have uh, you know, a few technological solutions in place to keep free people from bulk buying. Um, and then again, our goal is to make sure that we have a, a core group of humans <laughs> Uh, that we know, love the project and, and are interested in the project. And we want to make sure that we're protecting those individuals and their rights to, to buy in. Um, the, the good news is that institutional uh, money uh, does not, at least at this point, um, see this as such a viable, you know, Disney can put their money wherever they want. <laughs> uh, Universal has lots of money to spend on the, the pieces of IP. So at this juncture, they're not looking to go sweep in and buy up a bunch of NFTs. And then hopefully by the time that this is a true concern for institutions uh, kind of pushing out the middleman or, or the little guy, we will have more technological pieces in place to help prevent that. Uh, a brand new question. What do you think is the legal, um, well, legal force might be a reasonable term of smart contracts in Hollywood in particular? So we've, we've already had some of the guests have talked about it within the context of music, mm -hmm. but do you feel that it would be recognized legally by the major studios and the major talent? Yeah, the answer is right now, absolutely it won't um, and isn't. Uh, and in fact, all of the smart contracts that we have right now, um, despite what some people may say, are not legally significant. And what is legally significant is the terms of service and terms of use uh, and privacy policies on these websites. So um, a lot of times there are parallel legal contracts, like tangible legal contracts, where Daryl has signed a uh, physically or digitally that can be linked into the metadata. And I think that's a great, you know, temporary solution. But uh, part of why I'm so excited about our underlying IP protocol is because we are going to build out legally significant technology. Uh, if you think about a legal contract, it's very much like code in that uh, there's a bit of a boilerplate and then material terms change. Uh, that's not too different from code. And so, um, Right now, our code is very simplified, and it is literally, I give you $100 of fiat, and you give me 0 0.001 ETH or whatever. Uh, that's a very simple transaction, um, but we have to create more robust technology in order for this to be legally significant. And it's important to note that no matter what we code in the contract itself, if that does not parallel what is legal in the in the real real world, um, then it is not legally significant, which means that um, it's it's like I could create a contract that says uh, 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 Nate is going to buy my hat, right? Um, but uh, if he buys my hat, then I also have rights to his firstborn child or something crazy, right? That would not be legally enforceable. And so it doesn't matter what's in the contract. What matters is what is legally enforceable, what the laws are. And those laws are constantly shifting. And then how our contract um, compares to what is legally enforceable. And so what I am very concerned about as a, a, a sector as a whole is that we have a lot of individuals who are actually making promises um, about future royalties and all these things. Uh, and they're claiming that this is immutable, right? Because it's in the contract. But the reality is that their terms of service don't even reflect the immutability of that contract. And so um, it's very important for us as a, a, a team and, and as a community that is working to protect these artists' rights that we find legal contracts that we can embed into the metadata to prove that these are legally significant um, and that all parties involved are agreeing to the legal significance of this. And that also we, we stay abreast of the ever evolving laws and that we make sure that our technology is enforceable uh, and, and in line with the law. Because as soon as we step outside of those bounds, that's where we really get into trouble. Okay, this next question is from me. Um... Some of the things we've seen with the musicians over the last week and a half have suggested that you have the original 
creative work, which is the music, but what Web3 allows you to do is to make unique various other sort of contextual elements. So let's say visual artwork or merchandise, or you just mentioned token gating. So the idea that you can provide unique access to some additional materials like um, photographs, rare photographs, or maybe um, the lyrics on a hand handwritten piece of paper. Yeah. Have you have you seen any of that around cinema? This this idea just came to me. Have you seen anything like that around cinema, where let's say you have the production, which is the film itself, but have there been additional materials? So, for example, on an independent on an independent film, you might be given unique behind the scenes footage or unique messages from the actors or maybe extra merchandise. Has, is independent filmmaking tried to do that at all to add extra value around the film? Yeah, there are a handful of projects that have done some really interesting things. Uh, cool Cats uh, being one of them. Um, I know uh, Cayadita, which is a film uh, when we spoke at the Ethereum conference last year in Barcelona um, that they were I, I think that they were fundraising at the time and they were uh, exploring some of these options. But I know that for uh, for us, we are definitely doing that. So if you buy like a behind the scenes pass on Kino, um, you can actually get behind the scenes access, but we're also giving you rights to special merchandise and you're going to get bloopers and you're going to get Q and A's with the cast and crew. So there are some values baked in. Um, and it's important to note that we very much segregate the value propositions of each of our NFTs or smart contracted assets. So, because again, you don't want to get in trouble with securities regulations. So to say that if you buy a share of the movie, then you're going to get, uh, you're going to get value from the share of that property. And then you're also going to get access to these things. It is doable, but we have chosen um, because of where we see the legal structure and the landscape going to kind of separate those things. And so if you buy a share in our film, we're also going to give you an NFT that gives you token gated access to this behind the scenes community. Um, but the short answer is there are some people who are doing some very cool things. And, and we're also working through engagement as well, like polls. Um, um, the Midnight Movie Club, who uh, we reached out to early on um, uh, and had great conversations with, they were doing some really interesting things around education and trying to educate people with this. So if you bought into their NFT, they would uh, give you access to certain behind the scenes stuff, but also like an education portal for people who couldn't really go to film school. You mentioned, this is me, oh no, this, this isn't me actually, just by pure chance, almost the same question has come in simultaneously. Um, it's funny, someone has, okay, so I, 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 I had a question in my head, someone just asked the same question simultaneously, and then before I even read it out, they answered their own question and they said, you've already answered it. So we're in this sort of, we've, we've, we've fallen into a black hole. Amazing. Um, but what 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 if anything do you think that this technology could offer um, music videos? Have you seen anything that comes to mind? Yes, um, I what I actually hope is that there's a version of this in the future where, um, and it depends on the value of that. So I think it's like uh, you can either buy in and have uh, maybe some financial rewards depending on how often this movie is streamed or something like that. I think there's value there, but I think also token gated access to just the artists themselves and the community around this artist. What I believe the future is, is community. And I believe that we as a society um, are desperately looking for groups for with which we align, whether that be morally or artistically or however. Um, and so what I, I perceive is that um, by buying into these groups, we will actually get access to a community of people and individuals who enjoy this type of art, who uh, believe in the cause or the expression of this individual artist. And then um, and then it may be that you're owning a frame of this, of this music video. So like there's literally a, an image that you have future rights to or that sort of thing. It may be just access to a community of filmmakers where you can listen to uh, or get access to uh, special drops or, you know, um, there are going to be different versions of these 
um, songs that I imagine, you know, especially as, as we become more layered as a society where you can pull this and you may own a piece of this music video, which is, is really cool, but it also gives you access to the stems from the song itself. Um, or if you're an artist and you want to like, what I love when I watch TikTok is the layer of creativity and creation that has happening in real time in the web two space. Imagine being able to monetize that and build on top of it so that you have this really dope music video. And then there's a VFX artist who comes in and goes, oh, you know what? I can make this explosion so sick and I could upgrade this element and then create my own version of this music video with my own visual filter on that. And it becomes not an extraction from the original, but it's it's layered value added on top of that. And I believe that this will inevitably lead to a type of creativity and collaboration beyond which we can even imagine. Something that came up again yesterday, we had a couple of guys from Water and Music, which you may know about. They're yes. the, at the big research center for this technology, but their main focus is, is, is music. So, are there any cinema DAOs or video DAOs that have that are interesting to you, either creatively or financially? I think that there are, there are several DAOs that are are uh, coming up. I think that we haven't really figured out the DAO structure, and I think a lot of a lot of these DAOs are in violation of securities <laughs> uh, regulations because they are promising future royalties, um, and I don't think they understand the second and third effects of that. Um, so I am very con concerned uh, for some of the, the DAOs that exist uh, because they, there isn't regulation um, and, and there are all kinds of rules. If you're going to raise from the general public, even under like CF, so uh, the crowdfunding laws, um, you have to uh, token gate for some amount of time. You can't allow just anyone to go sell that. You have to hold it for a certain period. I think the period is one year. Um, and there's all kinds of laws around this that Web3 is kind of just circumventing. Um, and so I think the compliance uh, issues for a lot of these DAOs um, ha has me concerned. But the general idea, I believe, I am extremely bullish on. Um, the general idea that we are going to have communities that can create value and um, and and projects and all of that. I, I I believe that this is the future. I just think that we have there is going to be a very massive reckoning in this space, and we're we're seeing it now. Um, but we need sensible regulation, and we need the laws to catch up to technology because right now we're living in such an archaic era. Um, so the, the short answer is, yes, there are some cinema DAOs. I think they're very cool, but I am concerned because the ones that I'm aware of right now, I think are, are kind of infringing on some securities regulations. And I don't know that they will exist in this form in the next five years, um, but I'm bullish on the idea as a whole. So the, the technology is being used a bit irresponsibly at the moment by people who are pro or guaranteeing just with a promise, they're promising or guaranteeing future royalties, which are impossible to promise. Exactly. And, and it's not even just that they're promising future royalties, but the expectation or potential of future royalties. So mm -hmm. if I am on here, and, and the thing that I think distinguishes Kino from a lot of individuals in the space is that we're building within the rules of the securities regulations. We have registered as a crowdfunding portal with the SEC. We are, we are acknowledging what we were doing from the very beginning. So I knew when I reached out to Austin that we were going to be selling securities and I wanted to make sure that we were compliant where, and, and doing that, it, it takes away a lot of the freedom of, uh, of web three, because now I can no longer just anonymously sell this to anyone because, um, that is in fact in violation of the law. So if you say, Hey, in the future, we might make some money. And if we do, we're going to give you a small piece of it. That in itself means that you are selling a registered security in the eyes of the U S government. And then there is a laundry list of, uh, things that you have to do then to comply with that. And I think they are, it's not irresponsible to, and I think it's very well intended to say, hey, if we make money in this in the future, we want you to participate. That is a beautiful thing. I don't think that should be shamed, um, but the laws are written in such a way that in order to do that, you have a, a, a responsibility um, to, uh, to fulfill a list of obligations and, and those just aren't being filled.
Yeah, and obviously that's much more important in movie making just because it's so much more expensive, right? Exactly. Exactly. You know? It's yeah. The, in fact, music is going to be an, an uh, sorry, not to cut you off, David, I apologize, but music innovates so much more quickly than film and television. Uh, it's always it's always a decade or two ahead. And so, you know, we've seen like through use cases like um, Royal.io or Sound.xyz or, or StemsDAO, there, there are all kinds of uh, individuals who are doing, uh, you know, water and music uh, who are doing these very cool collaborative um, creative projects. And I think it, it's such a lower barrier to entry because it doesn't take uh, $5 million to make a feature film. It's a it's, uh, it's, uh, few engineers and songwriters and badasses uh, who have you know collected a few thousand dollars worth of equipment themselves in their own homes, and they're able to create some really compelling music. Yeah, I could make, you know, people can make an incredible album for 25 cents, but that's, that's not going to make a great movie. So, yes, exactly. A uh, couple more questions. If people in the future, in the near future, use NFTs to give um, uh, fans or audience members exclusive access to exclusive content, can you imagine what the profit breakdown might be? So let's say it's a, a film with a small budget. Where do you think... Um, do you think the film itself will always be the place of the greatest potential profit, or can you see a world in which the the peripheral experiences are just as valuable? I definitely believe in the latter, and I think that it's actually already the case, which is why um, and, and like for instance, the the Marvel movies, uh, they make infinitely more in merchandising. I think I think. Um, Disney alone made something like seven billion in merchandising. Uh, so you're talking about hats and T-shirts and that sort of thing. Not to mention the experiences at Disney World and Universal. So uh, I personally um, am very bullish on the idea that the experiences and merchandising value far outweighs the individual um, the individual film. And in fact, it's why uh, it's it's why uh, Star Wars and and um, why Lucas Films was so brilliant and George Lucas saying like, hey, yeah, I want to maintain all the merchandising rights um, because he understood the value of the action figures and the video games. I mean, probably not the video games at the time, but the uh, the ancillary value of a piece of art. It's, it's never about just the piece of art itself. And I would say that probably um, for, you know, the the foreseeable future, we're going to get into a place where this is going to become metaverses and it's going to become experiences beyond, you know, in, in AR, VR world, uh, where that could actually uh, spin off into video games. And, um, you know, there are dozens of ways of monetizing a single piece of IP, um, whether that be comic books or, um, you know, films or whatever. And I, I am very excited for the world in which uh, we can create multiple avenues of exploring a, a, an individual piece of medium because um, movies are amazing, but it's it's just one experience. And um, I think that we're probably a decade away from being able to uh, experience film in, in a completely different way um, that is a bit of gamification. It is a bit of uh, an AR VR experience. It is literally going into the environment of the set in a virtual way to watch your actors rehearse a scene. That's cool. Um, and that is something that is very tangibly on the horizon. It's interesting you mentioned that because, so I'm in Westwood, right, right beside mm -hmm. the UCLA campus. And so last night, um, there was the debut of the new Shazam movie. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I'm going to send some people in Telegram some pictures of that because it's always amazing to see, you know, over the course of a night, this incredible red carpet goes up with all of the, 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 the incredible uh, ornamentation and then people have a party for three hours and then it all comes down again within 24 hours. But as, as, you, as you know, we had terrible weather over the last two, three weeks in Los Angeles, just very rare rainstorms. Yeah. And so so there was this movie premiere and the red carpet and all of the stars turned up and they were all covered from the rain. But despite the horrible weather, um, there were just people going round and round the block in terrible 
with tiny umbrellas, they were getting soaked. And to me, that was proof of the fact that sure, there's the movie, you can go and see the movie in a nice warm cinema, but that's, that's not what people wanted. They wanted an additional experience. They wanted to see the actors. They wanted to maybe get a sense of the razzmatazz and so on surrounding the event. So those are people who are willing to, you know, maybe catch a cold and spend the next few days in bed because what they wanted was not just the film. They wanted the additional experience around the film. Yes. We want to tangibly be a part of this creative process. Like there's a, there's a reason to me that, that um, I, I think the red carpet is such a great example, but it's like you, you watch individuals work uh, on screen, whether that is a director that you love, like Jordan Peele or Tarantino or whomever, or that's an artist, um, you know, like, uh, the movie The Whale, I, Brandon Fraser's performance was absolutely incredible. I wasn't, uh, I, I don't think that film itself where I, I didn't feel great walking away from that theater, but I was totally moved. And, um, and then to know that you're in the same room with someone who is creating this kind of experience for you, that's amazing. And I think that um, I had that desire uh, to be a part of this environment and to meet these people and engage. And I think that, you know, empathetically, if if there's something that it draws us in um, where we're willing to sit in some shitty rain <laughs> uh, to just catch a glimpse of a star that we love, to me, there's an opportunity here to kind of break that barrier down and give real tangible interactions, which is you know, again, watching my dad turn into a little kid when Matt Damon FaceTimed him was one of the highlights of my life. And I want to kind of create that experience for the rest of the world. Like the, there's no reason why there should be this barrier here other than this is the way that it has always been. And I think that's a terrible reason to continue to do something. Do you use um, KYC software at all? So know your customer. Yes. Um, okay, great. Um, are you aware, this is an audience question, are you aware of any platform that automates that process? Um, I cannot imagine, says the question asker, that uh, companies do this uh, themselves for each and every token holder. Um, it really depends on the, uh, the individual. We have to, in order to be compliant with securities regulation, do some KYC AML stuff. That's just the way that it works. Um, there are a lot of individuals who don't do this process, and that's why I'm very concerned about their uh, the legality of what they're doing. But um, the, the short answer is that there's a lot of uh, fantastic providers who help uh, automate this system for you. Um, if you do just a simple Google search, you can find uh, quite a few KYC uh, providers. I imagine that we will eventually get to a place where um, that won't that information will automatically be stored in your wallet, um, and so you can go through KYC just by connecting your wallet, and then all of your information is stored in the metadata, and it automatically fills out for you. Um, we're not at that place yet, but I am excited by the again that frictionless usable. Uh, side of the the equation, I think that's going to be um, extremely valuable to us as a society. Is it possible to sell an idea in Web3 format? Um, and if it is, have you seen any example of that? Uh, I believe that it is possible. Uh, I don't, I think that, you know, I'm trying to think of um, maybe Tayadita being an example of that, where they didn't have a film, they just had the idea. Um, and they, they took a pitch out and people invested in those NFTs um, or purchased those NFTs. Uh, so I, sorry, I guess- Sorry, how, how do you spell that? Uh, Kayadita, C-A-L-L-A, here, I'll find it. Uh, C-A-L-L-A-D-I-T-A. -A -A. Um, it was a short film that turned into a feature uh, uh, as a just a simple example. Um, That's correct. I, and, and I think there are others. Um, you know, they're, they're, the reality is that I, I sell ideas as a, for a living. That's what, what I would consider. You know, I've sold uh, two ideas in the room to Disney and to Netflix, which is, um, again, very, very rare. I, I feel very fortunate that I've been able to do that. Um, it's, it's not easy. Um, so 
the fact that he was able to do this uh, in the Web3 space, I think is super interesting. And it kind of proves that there is a market out there for people who want to get in on IP early because we love an idea. And I go, that's fucking cool. I would love to see it on screen. That That is very exciting to me. And it's the future that we're building toward. For Kino, for our first several years, we are only... Um, we're only working with kind of bigger names, A-list talent, Oscar, Emmy, Golden Globe winners um, in our creative process. But my goal is to, again, systematic decentralization so that in five years, uh, Nate comes up with a great idea for a script and he goes, I have this concept. Uh, I believe that it has legs and he can put it out there on our on our protocol, our underlying IP, and then that can find its own support, whether that's development funding or an actor who says, hey, you know what, this is a cool idea, I believe in this, or maybe Nate has the idea, but he doesn't know who the writer is, he can submit this idea and one of the recent graduates from Berkeley can go, you know what, I know how to, I know how to turn this into something that's amazing and we can create, again, that collaboration collaborative, um, that collaborative uh, opportunity all on chain so that people's rights and ideas are protected and their value adds are protected as this whole thing comes together. So the idea for the film was initially sold in Web3 or? Uh, not for my projects. Uh, those were initially sold to uh, streamers, but there are a handful of of people who have turned ideas into PFP projects. Um, you know, Cool Cats, they've done, Kayadita, you know, created a short film, wanted to do the feature film, and he sold that idea as NFTs. Um, I see. So the short film existed, and then somebody using NFTs sold the idea as an so yes. what, what did that what did that look like? So so the short film already exists, and then somebody says this will make a great feature film. So how was the technology used? Yeah, so I believe what they did is they created a, uh, a uh, an NFT project uh, around the film using a lot of the stills from the short, uh, and then they allowed people to mint those and the proceeds, which I don't believe had any uh, securities value. So this was literally just like you were buying it, and I believe you were getting certain utilities or po perks. So imagine... Um, and don't quote me on this. You, you should check out, I think it's kayaditafilm.com. You can get the actual information. But as I recall, um, it was like utilities. So you would get an associate producer credit and a private link to watch the film if you purchase this thing for, I don't know, half an ETH or something like that. Um, and so the idea was that there were, it was almost like Kickstarter, how they had different uh, levels. Um, and so you might get a Q&A with the cast and crew. Um, you might get uh, your name uh, put in the credits. You might get um, uh, an avatar uh, uh, in the film or something. I, I don't recall. But the idea is that they they created perks, and then you would buy these, uh, you would buy the the NFT, and then you would get certain perks, and then all of the funds that were raised went to actually making the film. You're absolutely right. Yeah, you were, you were right about the URL, and it gives lots of information about how they how how things are minted, how to invest, and so on and so forth. So that's that's a really cool example. Um, let me just have a look. Uh, Nate, we've got five minutes left. Shall I hand it back to you, maybe for uh, some closing observations? Yeah, that sounds good. Well, Dale, thank you so much. I mean, this was absolutely incredible. I mean, hearing you talk at Denver and then hearing you now, it's, I mean, I've learned so much from you and I'm, I know all the students have as well. So yeah, thank you so much for your time and for, for coming in to talk to us. Thank you guys so much. This was incredible. I am uh, super excited to see uh, what projects come from this group and find funding through venture capital. And, um, you know, it's, it's a process and I am excited to see what arises because I know that there are many brilliant minds um, in this room and I'm sure that you guys are going to add values that I can't even begin to imagine. And that's super exciting. Actually, I have one uh, closing 20 second observation, uh, not observation, just request actually. Yeah. Um, I see that in some of the, the, the journalistic materials surrounding your work, there are links to all of your socials and so on, including actually your company email. Would you mind if occasionally one or two people reached out and had some questions about how best to go about their um, adventure? 
Yeah. Uh, look, feel free to reach out. Um, my life is extremely busy, uh, but I love helping people. And I, if I can't provide an answer, I can probably point you in the right direction and at least provide some encouragement. So please uh, feel free to reach out. Um, I am, I will do what I can because I believe uh, that this is the future. So yeah, absolutely. Um, and if you haven't checked out the socials of the company, uh, Kino makes movies. It's there's a lot of really cool things that we're doing. We do Q and A's with uh, like actors and filmmakers and uh, cinematographers and and you know all of that every week. We're constantly trying to provide value. Uh, so if you're into cinema, um, please check us out. Reach out with any questions. That's great. And obviously, you know, what we're doing is we're forming a community on our own. So we can also research opportunities because needless to say, you're incredibly busy. That's amazing. Yeah. But please, you know, feel free. You've been very kind. This is great. Um, and personally, I'm very grateful to you. So especially this early in the morning. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm glad to do it. I was in the army. I know how to get up early. That's true. Uh, <laughs> David, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time, Nate, everyone. Uh, I appreciate everything. This was fantastic. Thank you. Best of luck with everything. We'll be on the lookout right. for, your, for your next films and everything as well. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, a couple of months, we should be live on platform. It's super exciting. So thank you, everybody. Wait, wait. All right. Bye. Bye.